and show my screen. Okay, so I'll take a minute here. Uh, we have a guest today. His name is Jody McNamer. He's a friend of mine. We've, we've known each other a few years now, right, Jody? Um, yeah. And uh, Jody's out in uh, Washington. He's a, a coach. Well, the way I knew you first was as kind of like a real estate investor, real estate broker, but you also do some consulting too, right, and coaching. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yep. So uh, I asked Jody to come on. I, w I was kind of looking for a topic today, and we were chatting about something else. Um, and in the past, I've talked with Jody about uh, investor lead generation strategies um, because I know you have some specialized knowledge, both of, both as an investor and as a broker. And in these slow times of year when, you know, everybody seems to be checked out for the summer, uh, this time of year, Christmas, uh, investors are always a good place to go, right? Yeah. Um, um, so I'll just come on in. That's a quick intro for everybody. Uh, Jody, we'll drop your URL later if anybody wants to contact you. But um, let's start out. I'm going to let you talk. Um, just give me your spiel on why you think it's a good idea to work with investors. Yeah, totally. Well, you know, let me just give a quick background so everybody can kind of understand the context of the conversation. And then we'll kind of create some distinctions. Really, my goal in being here, number one, of course, is to support Ryan and what he's up to because, again, this is really all about generating leads and the ability to attract business to you. And so that's really what this session is about. Um, it may be in the context of investors, but look at investors really as just best practices around anyone who is a buyer. Because even your single family residence owners, uh, vast majority of them, that's exactly the way that they started to become an investor. They bought their own real estate, they bought it in a market that was increasing, and all of a sudden they're like, well, dang, if I can do it in my own single family residence, why wouldn't I be able to go do it for a rental home? Or maybe they retain a home, it becomes a rental, and they are, become move up buyers. So really, you need to think about every one of your potential transactions that you've done, your buyers that now are homeowners, as potential investors as well. So be thinking about that as we uh, talk about not only just, um, you know, hey, you think about the, the, the guy who's either uh, going down to the auction and doing buy and holds, or maybe you think about somebody who just attended a RIA uh, meeting and is a complete waste of your time or went to some kind of seminar, whether it be, you know, Than or Edward or, you know, uh, somebody that, that they spent 2000 to $30,000 on education, which all of that actually can be really good based upon the quality of education. But at the end of the day, if they've made that type of investment, most likely they are going to make some type of investment in purchasing a uh, investment property. So, so really, uh, my, my background is exactly that. Um, I started, actually bought my first house, I was 21 years old. Actually, it wasn't that yet, it was 20. Um, uh, it was a blind assumption, I had no credit, I had no money. Um, but I knew I just wanted to get into a house and happened to be able to buy it um, at a, a, a crazy back at that point. Believe it or not, it was a 13% interest rate. And I'm thinking, well, that's stinking high, but at least I got into it. Um, and then uh, realized the power of that. It doubled in value, went out and started buying rental properties. And then that kind of led me to where I am today, which is uh, not necessarily... Uh, doing anything in residential assets anymore, but moved all those into commercial and office assets and office buildings. And so that is kind of that logical progression of investors. Uh, I'm also a licensed real estate broker. I'm here in Washington State. I'm a Washington State educated or education trainer. Uh, I'm a coach. I've also owned a real estate brokerage. So pretty much anything that has to do with real estate, I've had the opportunity to pretty much make every mistake that you can make and now I get paid to help others not make those same kind of mistakes. So, cool. <laughs> so, yeah. so, so hopefully uh, uh, out of this session, again, as we create it, um, it really is going to be about why would you even want to go talk to an investor? And I think the real key is, is how to make sure that if, in fact, you do want to go talk to an investor, how to make sure that they're not a complete waste of time and how to vet them. And I'm going to kind of share, you know, the, the, the secret strategy to be able to qualify an investor in five questions or less and whether or not they're going to be a gold mine 
or just a complete waste of time. And you yep. have to run every potential te uh, investor through this test. Otherwise, you'll end up losing tons of money. Um, and when I say lose tons of money, your time is your most valuable commodity. So you have to really ask these top five questions. We're going we're to go through that. And then I'm also going to give you another super secret strategy that very few people are using, not only to go out and get additional listings, but it is a guarded secret that you then can demonstrate the value and you can start taking investors away from other real estate brokers who are doing re repeat business with them at the auction or taking care of all of their list backs after they have rehabbed that property. So okay. is, that any, is, is that enough of an intro you think, um, Ryan, or anything else you kind of want me to expand on? or? No, that's great. That's great. So, so yeah, I was hoping you touched on it a little bit there. I was hoping you'd go into the number one objection that I hear from agents about investors, and that's the time wasting factor. And maybe we can not dwell on that because I think everybody has in their head has wasted time with an investor. Uh, can you talk about yeah. some of the positives, like why you know things such as getting the list backs and and you know cash transactions, things like that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so the answer is, is yes, you have to acknowledge that working with um, fake investors or wannabe investors or investors that think that they're investors but are not or call themselves investors is a complete waste of time. But working with an actual investor is a fantastic use of time. So you have to really get that distinction. An investor, just because they call themselves as an investor, as they call themselves an investor doesn't mean that they're actually an investor. But people who actually are investors, they are qualified investors, a fantastic way to use, use your time. And here's why. Real investors are loyal. Now, that is something that the vast majority of real estate brokers don't realize. When you are working with an investor and you bring them good quality investment properties, they are loyal to you. They come back to you. Um, now, if you're providing them you know, crappy investment opportunities and you're wasting their time, then they're not going to be loyal because they're looking for someone. They also will absolutely list their home back with you as long as you can demonstrate the value. And here's how you do that. You demonstrate the value by letting them know you are a trusted authority and an expert in the market. And the way that you become a trusted authority is you say, when you purchase this home, here is the minimum that you're going to need to do to add value to that property. Does that neighborhood need granite countertops? Does it not? Does it need a five-piece uh, you know, bath or does it not? Does it need this level of carpet or this level of finishes? See, a, real estate, a good real estate broker will say, this is the minimum acceptable level to be able to get an offer in a reasonable amount of time. And there are other real estate brokers that say, no, you need to max this place out. And the investor ends up spending another twenty dollars or $30,000 that they could have captured in margin simply because um, the market, be, be determining, well, is it tight in that market? What are the level of finishes? You can way overbuild. And so when you have that open and frank conversation with that investor, you really become a valued asset to them. So they're happy to pay your commissions and they are loyal, but realize that you will be compensated as a direct coefficient of the value that you provide for them. And the way that you provide value, you bring them good quality properties. I'm going to show you how to do that. Um, vast majority of real estate brokers are not do, using this technique. Number two, you become an expert in that particular area that they're reselling in. And you advise them on the level of finishes and the types of finishes that they're going to need, give them suggestions of ways that they can save money. And then ultimately, you know, you put your money where your mouth is. You know, you deliver. You know, if you say average market time is 30 days, well, then you sell that home in that average market time. Um, if you price it, always make sure that you're hedging um, on the lower end of the market because you want them at all costs to be able to maintain their margin. Okay. So, um, so those are some of the real keys of working with investors. Okay. So the fir the the repeat transactions, list backs, uh, a lot of cash transactions, right? Without mortgage financing. Um, Dude, huge, right? I mean, absolutely huge. They can close quickly. They 
uh, their offers become very attractive because especially when you're in multiple offer situations, you know, typically they're closing with no inspection contingency because they know they're going to fix the stuff anyways. They're closing with cash. They can close quickly. Oftentimes they are willing to compete with escalators um, depending again on that particular market because real estate investors, true investors, are actually building on volume too. That's the other real thing you've got to get. These little one and done investors that will kill you, um, those are the ones where you're going to spend a ton of time but you'll never get any repeat business at all. Um, you want people that are fixing and flipping one, two, three, four, ten homes a month and those are the ones where you build it into a system. And so that's a, that's a real... You, you bring What's up that? a point. Some of these guys, I remember in my practice in Philly, like some, some guys would just do transactions because they just needed to keep the construction guys busy. Even if there wasn't a lot of margin in them, they didn't want to lose their crew. Dude, that's absolutely right, Ryan. You are right on the money on that because they are going to lose. I mean, if all of a sudden they lose their key plumber or their framer or whatever it is, yeah, then their entire business model suffers as a result of that. Right, so, so it seen, is that much of a balance. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes I, I've seen a deal where it's like no margin for the investor because well, I just need a project. Maybe it'll work out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, All right. It's, it's a big deal. So you've got you've got highly you know if you build a portfolio of these guys, you only need a handful for it to be have a major impact on your GCI. I mean, if you had three yeah. or four serious investors who buy once every few months, that's huge. Um, yeah. Um, so, so we kind of get the why here. I'm just kind of guiding through the bullet points, Jody. You, you keep going, but um, your five no, questions. You, you opened a loop there that's probably driving everybody cr crazy, and I think now's a good time. Let's get into those five questions and make sure we're not hanging out with tire kickers all day. <laughs> nice. That sounds good. So, so really the five questions that every investor should be able to answer literally right off the top of your head, which the first question is, what is your investment criteria? What's your investment criteria? Now, if they look at you strange or if they don't know how to answer that question is what is your investment criteria, you maybe can ask one clarifying question. And the one clarifying question would be something to the effect of, um, well, what specifically, what specific type of home are you looking for? And then maybe a clarifying question after that, if they're still looking at you, would be, well, what specific area do you buy in, right? Now, if they're still looking at you puzzled and they say something like, well, hey, I'm looking for anything that's a deal, run. <laughs> run from them. Yeah. No, run from them. It's oh, a complete and utter waste of time. <laughs> Dude, yeah, everybody's like, hell, I'm looking for a deal. You got some? Call me. I'm in Seattle. I'll buy it. I mean, my, here, you know, my email, jody at mcnamer.com. Send me an email. If you got a deal, I'll buy it, right? I mean, everybody's looking for a deal. But real investors, they will tell you, I typically buy three twos, not in a war zone. I don't want a busy street. I have to have a garage. Um, I have to have a minimum of 1,600 square feet. I prefer ramblers, right? They know, right? They know what they specialize in. They'll tell you there the are other yeah, they'll tell you the ratio yeah. of purchase, yeah. That's exactly right. They'll just say, hey, listen, I only buy things at 65% uh, ARV. I typically am putting 15 to 20 points into it on the rehab. Um, my selling costs are going to be 8 to 10%. You know, I do give, you know, lender concessions or uh, first-time homebuyer concessions. It, it's a model, right? They, they really get, they say, hey, I typically buy in these counties. Now, if other things come along, of course, they'll look at those things, but this is their investor criteria. All right, so, so that's the number one. What specific type of property are you looking for? Okay, so that's the first question. You want yeah. specific criteria? Second question is, yeah, second question is, is so how, uh, how do you typically purchase? You know, how do you typically purchase? Are you a cash buyer? And that's it. That's exactly, how do you, how do you typically purchase? Are you a cash buyer? And if they look at you and say, oh, yeah, you know, I'm a cash buyer, absolutely. Then you ask, well, is it your personal cash or are you using some type of direct lender? So why these questions are really important is if they're him hawing around, right, and they don't know, uh, and, and, and again, if they're using a hard money lender or direct lending, whatever that is, dude, who cares, right? 
they know about it, but if they're trying to hide some of these things, if they're saying that it's own cash, and again, these are all the sub questions, and if they say, oh yeah, I'm buying it with my own cash, perfect. So do you typically um, submit a bank statement or a, or a bank letter with your purchases, right? That's important because everybody say, oh yeah, it's my own cash, perfect. Now if you suspect that they don't have a bank letter or they don't have a bank statement and they're him hawing around or they're hesitant to answer that question, run. They're lying to you. I mean, it's just all there is to it because anyone that's an investor knows they have to have a copy of their bank statement or they have to have a copy from their, of their bank letter. And by the way, a bank letter, um, you know, if, if they're a hard money lender, then they're going to have an approval letter typically. Um, or if they're working with maybe another investor or maybe a friend who has the bank account, they're still going to provide that bank statement or a letter um, there as well. So, so that, that's really, really important. So Are you a cash buyer? Financing. How do you typically... What's that? So nail them down on financing. How do you purchase? Yeah, yeah have to. Okay. I mean, absolutely have to. Third question is, how quickly can you close? So how quickly can you close? This is an indicator of their capacity, right? So I mean, how quickly can you close? And if somebody says, well, hey, as quick as the transaction can come together, or as quick as um, I can get a clean title, those are the people that you want to work with, right? Because investors realize that it is about velocity, right? This is one of the key things that investors use to compete is velocity. They absolutely uh, understand that. So um, if you have somebody saying, well, yeah, we've got to get through an inspection and my typical close is 30 days, man, there's something up. There is just something up with that. An investor should be saying, hey, I can close as quick as the transaction is ready to close. Because they've already done that. Is a, exactly. I mean, that, that's a real true investor. I mean, that's a real, real true investor. So the next question that you need to ask is, what level of rehab are you comfortable with? Right? What level of rehab? Now, if they can't answer that and they say something like, hey, no job is too, too tough, uh, then you need to follow up with a question and say, then, so you'll do teardowns, right? You know, it, and it really, it really concerns me because there are specific investors that when you tell them, well, yeah, no project's too small, well, then give me some examples of projects that you've worked on in the past. What's been the worst? What's been the best? And if it's lipstick, you know, carpet and paint, then great, you know, versus, hey, no, we literally have to demolish this place uh, some investors have models of we'll remove trailers from vacant land and build stick-built homes. Fantastic investor model. You have to understand that, that that's what they're looking for. That's part of that investment criteria. Other investors are saying, hey, listen, I specialize in the rehab properties that no one else will touch. The foundation work, roofs, HVAC, all that, no problem, because I realize I can buy that at a deeper discount but I have to have a higher level or higher skill set in order to do that. Um, but unless you know and unless they can specifically say what kind of, uh, what kind of rehab, that's a, that's a real key indicator of whether or not they're a real investor or not. Cool. Make sense? Yep. Two, three. So let's see. I think that's number four, right? So where, yep. where are we at in our questions? Yep. Number five now. What level of rehab? And then the last one. Yeah, level refab. And then finally then would be, um, uh, are, do you list back, again, it's really a qualifying question, are you comfortable listing back the property with me? Right, okay. You know, once I send it to you. And if the answer is no, you don't want to work with them. Gotcha. Right? I mean, that's it. You, you know, you're not going to give your really cool, great property that I'm about to show you how to get um, if they're not interested in listing back with you, that's not a relationship. So how? Um, you, because go ahead. What's that? So how do no, you? please turn, go ahead. How do you turn them down without being a jerk? So you know, you by the time you've asked yeah. five, you know you got somebody real or not. What, what do you say? Yeah. So then what you basically say? Hey, listen. You know what? I completely respect that you have relationships with other people. No, no problems with that. Completely respect that. Um, the relationships that I have with the investors that I work with is I expect 
to get paid for the value that I bring to the relationship. So for me, I look at relationships as being a long-term relationship. I work very hard to find investment grade properties and every investor knows that that's the trick right now, right? Everyone's looking for them. Anybody who's an investor, um, and, and that goes, there, there's another sl slight question, uh, which I think you probably know which is good, which is what's your capacity? So when it says, you know, what level of rehab and then uh, is, is really what's your capacity? Like how many homes do you buy? Okay. And real true investors have this concept of what we would kind of call infinite capacity. We all kind of joke about it a little bit, which is, you know, it seems like w when we're all looking for a deal, we're all flush with cash, right? We got tons of money, but then all of a sudden we'll have all these deals and we're broke. And it's just the way the business kind of works, right? But we always work off of this concept of infinite capacity because we'll joke with each other as investors, you know, as we'll come and say, hey, Bill, um, you know, I'm, a little, I'm a little light on cash right now. Can I borrow some money so I can buy this deal? And that's what we'll do as investors. We'll share that amongst each other. Um, or we'll say, hey, Bill, I'll give you this deal because I don't want it to go, but I'm, I'm capped out right now. Um, but you always want to have investors that have the capacity to buy that. But, but going back to not being a jerk, it's just you're there to develop a relationship. And you're not interested in just doing a one-off transaction with them. You're just not interested in doing uh, one-off transactions. You're interested in developing a relationship. Hey, I understand your job is to purchase properties. I'd love to sell you one, but I work with my investors both on the buy and the sell. And, uh, and, and that's that. And what's interesting is, is oftentimes you have to take a step back for them to take a step forward because uh, true investors will respect you for that. See, you can't chase this work. You have to attract it. And the way that you attract it is by having a property that they're interested in purchasing. That brings and us, there's nothing. Yeah, say that, that one more time. That brings us into the, the lead gen stuff, right? Into yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so, so if you want to go work with or go ahead, Ron. I'm sorry, man. Yeah, that's all right. I didn't mean to, to, to butt you off, but that's you, – you, I know you just hit the key thing there in terms of attracting an investor is just going to be ha to have what they want, and that is something interesting to buy. Uh, Dude, I mean, that, that's exactly it. Yeah, that, that is exactly it. And, and I think um, – so I think here, here are a couple of keys um, in working with investors. So number one, you literally on this call – can work with an investor this week. I guarantee you. I guarantee you that if you listen for the next 10 minutes you and use that strat, this strategy that you can get an investor to work with this week if you want to. So here's how it works. Number one, you have to go where investors hang, right? So where are investors hanging? Well, a lot of people will teach that they're all hanging out at uh, RIA meetings, right? You know, Real Estate Investor Association of America, your local real estate, uh, you know, meetup groups, that kind of stuff. No, they're not. All the wannabe investors are hanging out there because they want to rub elbows with real investors. It's a huge waste of time. Now, with that being said, there are some investors, but they're typically the ones that are actually talking on the panel or making some type of presentation, not the ones trying to sell you a course. You know, those maybe were investors or maybe not. You know, maybe they just developed a package. Um, but you're looking for the people who are actually have the money, and here's the best way to determine who has the money. You actually go and see who has the money, and the best way to do that is go to your local foreclosure auction. So on the courthouse steps, sometimes still every day, other times it's once a week. You literally go to the county courthouse, county courthouse steps, sometimes they'll have an annex area depending on your municipality, and here's what you do. The way it works, it's in every municipality, the banks or the trustees hire a caller, and the caller is someone that says, is there anyone here for 1234 Main Street? Um, and if so, opening bid is such and such and such. Is there anyone that would like to uh, qualify to bid? And the process of qualifying for the bid is they literally go up to that caller and they show them copies of checks, bank checks. 
And those envelopes, anyone who has an envelope of checks is a qualified buyer and they're qualified to bid. Now here's what's so great. Now again, you're not going to go up and start hawking these people, right? Because they're trying to compete for properties with tons of other people at the auction. Now what's interesting about it is from a percentage standpoint, there's typically one or two dominant auction players that are buying a large majority of those properties, but there's a lot of other people that have envelopes. And what they do is in the mornings they go to the bank, they get their envelopes of cash, or envelopes of cashier's checks, they go, they're all excited, they've researched the property during the week, they went out and visited it, they're just like, yeah, this is it, this, they've set their maximum bid, and they were outbid on one, two, maybe multiple properties. And then they have to go and do the walk of shame back to the same bank teller, and, and the bank teller invariably says, hey, Bill, um, did you get a property? And that person then, week after week, goes and takes the walk of shame and says, nope, I didn't get one this week. Now just imagine if in fact you had a property that you could at the end of the auction say, hey, you know what, Bill, man, tough competition today. You know, if you're ever interested in taking a look at a investment grade property, give me a call because once in a while I come across one. In fact, here's a flyer of one I'm going to look at this afternoon. Be happy to drive out there with you if you'd like to, right? It is a perfect time to get an investor to work with. Absolutely perfect time to do that. Now, you may say that, well, but I don't have a property. I've looked at every multiple out there. There's no investment grade properties. Well, you need to go out then and you need to create your own inventory. Um, and the way to create your own inventory, I don't know, um, Ryan, if you can give me screen uh, access. I can, I can click on it. If not, I'll just share something here with you real quick. No, I can do that. There um, you go. But I'm going to show you, here we go. So I'm going to show you my screen number two. Here we go. Okay. So let's see. Each of you should be able to see, um, it should say data.seattle.gov. I happen to be in the Seattle-Tacoma area. I don't know. Let, let me know if you guys can actually see that yeah, or not. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so no matter where you are across the country, um, there are databases. They're open access. Uh, they're protected by... Um, you know, basically Freedom of Information Act, uh, because our government is supposed to be transparent in, these country, in this country. Um, this happens to be the, uh, what we would call Seattle Code Violations Database. Now I'm going to show you the one for Seattle, I'm also going to show you the one for Tacoma. And again, I'm just using this area because yeah, you just, it's an example of what you can go and pull. And here's how you would find this in your area. You would simply go to the, you know, Maricopa County code enforcement database, or you would go to Clark County code enforcement database, or you would go to Penrose County, whatever that would be, right, code enforcement database. And what you'll find is you'll find that here is all of the code violations for any particular uh, type of code violation and for any particular day. So as you can see on any one given day, there's tons of tickets that are being sent out and then they go back and get reinspected and then they fail. Well, typically what happens is these particular violations are renters. So renters, um, you know, we have, uh, you know, this person at 4635 South Fontanelle Street, multiple violations of the Seattle Housing Building and Maintenance Code violation. Well, the question becomes is, well, what's happening with this particular property? Well, if you go and you actually um, click then on this property and you see what the actual database, we know that they constructed a second story deck on the east side without permits and inspections. And again, this has kind of been, uh, maybe it's an ongoing thing, maybe it's a new thing, maybe it's something that they need to get taken care of. But oftentimes, especially if they're out of state homeowners, you can then send a quick letter you can put them into conversion, find their information um, as well with some of the intelligence search that it has, and make contact with them. Look them up on social media. Find, you know, contact information to say, hey, listen, you know, it looks like you own a home, uh, you know, over on 4635 South Fontanelle. I, I noticed that, you know, maybe you're having some challenges with the city of Seattle. Um, have you ever thought about selling it? And if so, I may have somebody that would be interested in buying it. 
Now, where that becomes really cool is you want to focus on these really ugly houses. And I'm going to show you this happens to be the Tacoma database. And what's interesting is you can kind of take a look at, we want to take a look at all the ones that are open. And we want everything that is like either derelict, substandard, dangerous, um, chronic nuisances, <laughs> junk vehicles. So maybe let's take a look at what we would call derelict homes. So we just want to look at every area and every derelict home in that particular area. So that's what we're doing. So these right now are all derelict homes that are hanging out that most likely something is going to need to happen with. And so when you go and actually click then on this particular person, we can see that, again, here's been a nuisance violation on 2011, 2014, 2015. It now has another violation. And we know that this particular person, here's where their tax, you know, their, their name. Well, does John still want to own this home even though he's having so many problems with this particular house? Well, maybe, maybe not. The great part about it is, is you can export all of this information to Excel, sort it by area, and guess what you have? You have your entire private potential multiple of investor properties now for your investors. Great. Now again, can deals be had here? Maybe, maybe not, but I guarantee you the vast majority of real estate brokers have no idea what you've now just been shown. So here is a yeah, go ahead, Ron. Yeah, go ahead. So so yeah, so you're going right there. You're building a, an exclusive list of some kind. Um, you, yeah, you just went really a lot further than we would go. I would typically go with conversion, which is uh, people who attend these sessions. Though we'll just build some kind of interesting list, like uh, foreclosures. Yeah, or, it's just, yeah, it's, yeah. Sorry about that, dude. I probably yeah went way too grand. Like, no, this is great. <laughs> I get a little geeked up about this stuff because, God, you know, there's just so much stick and opportunity, right? Yeah. I mean, we just we just pulled up, I mean, from a pure listing standpoint, I mean, you know, we just pulled up 337 potential homes that have open complaints against them that are some type of distress. Well, we know in real estate that distress is, you know, it, it's a big deal. So, right. anyway. So what you could do, I want to go along these lines. So at, at conversion, we have a landing page generator. I want, I want to tie it into conversion here now. Any of us could build a list like this. You could even manually write down five or six addresses every week and put it in a Google Doc uh, and offer it with our landing page generator. Um, but the key concept is you need to build a list of interesting properties, and, and investors are going to be highly receptive to downloading it or, or to getting it. Um, now, I don't want to cut you off, Jody, but you were going to take that list, and what were you going to do? You were going to, in person, old school style, in real life there, we say, you were going to kind of offer it to them at the courthouse? Yeah, so, so no. So this really became my private list, right? So what I was going to do is I was just going to say, huh, you know what? Here's a couple of interesting properties that I either could go out and visit, I could find these people on social media, I could make some kind of contact and basically just have a very brief conversation. So let's say like I know this property 807 North Pine in Tacoma, this is a very this is a highly desirable area. And I simply would try to make contact in advance sometime in the week with that homeowner and say, "Hey, um, you know, I have uh investor buyers uh that I uh work with. Um, if you would be interested at some point selling your home, I most likely would have someone that would be interested in buying it. If, in fact, I could bring such a buyer, would you be open to that discussion? And to the extent that I got a yes, yes, then at that point, I would offer it as a pre-market deal. And again, you want to make sure you're in compliance with all of your broker's rules and pre-listing rules of your multiple. You don't want to violate any of those things, of course. But what you're really trying to do is kind of create your own private list of deals, and it's because you've had conversation. And again, you're a broker, right? You're simply trying to bring buyers and sellers together, and these investor buyers are looking for homes that need value added to them, and these sellers are looking for someone to solve a problem that they potentially don't have the money to rehab the property. So. So just I'm going to go a little tactical here just to explain the specifics of how we would pull this off. Jody just Jody just built a list 
created a CSV. Maybe it was an Excel. Um, I would recommend Google Docs because they are linkable and shareable. Um, you go into the landing page generator at conversion. You, go, you do what I kind of just did on the screen here. Point and click. You can put your logo there or not. Tacoma Investors, big call out. Download a hand research list of distressed Tacoma properties with owners who are likely to sell. Your after URL redirect is just a link to your CSV, right, to, to your spreadsheet. Yeah. Um, see the list now works. Uh, you can hashtag them investor. Um, and in Jody, I don't know if you know, in conversion, you could have a separate drip campaign triggered based on that hashtag. Nice. Yeah. Um, and so they would receive the list and you can let conversion take over on uh, sending them regular IDX searches and so on. Um, right there. So super tactic cool. Yeah. Tactically build a list. Investors will reply. And I know firsthand that this is the lowest hanging fruit when it comes to getting somebody to click an ad online in particular and, and to give you an email address. Uh, yeah, I've, and, and the other thing is, is again, as long as you take them through those five questions and you qualify them as, as investors, it's very quick to qualify them. Once you've done this and had this conversation with three or four investors, it's very easy to tell the good ones from the bad. And the investors, you're really looking for people who are doing this, have experience doing it, and they're desperately looking for brokers to work with. Contrary to popular belief, but they're looking for the brokers who can add value like this, and this is what separates you. This is what is your unique selling proposition, is because you know how to find these types of properties uh, for those investors. So we don't have a form builder built in, but you could also you could always put this in or email it out. You can go to Google Forms and then ask your five questions right there, right? Oh, there you're perfect. That's brilliant. That's that's awesome. Yeah. So guys, that's, that's absolutely awesome. Yeah. So do a landing page like this. You build your list. Make sure you qualify them first. And this this is saving me too, Jody, because I never asked those questions and have spent a lot of my life dealing with tire kickers just because I'm a nice guy. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> but but I'm I'm not afraid to just ignore people. So if somebody answers the wrong on the form, uh, <laughs> you know maybe those are the leads you ignore. But the ones that uh, you know uh, hand in a pretty uh, specific form with the answers to the questions you like might be the ones you follow up with. But see, and that's you know Brian, that's one of the things to do like about what you do. You know, you really are the one that pioneered this whole using of the survey to further qualify um, and. Yeah, I mean, this is just so powerful because especially if you put this in the sweet spot, I mean, at any one given time, I mean, there's a couple hundred people down at any one given foreclosure market, depending on your area, of course. But if you can run them through this pre-qualification, again, this is this process of taking a step back. Don't be afraid to take a step back. You should have investors chasing you because once they find out that somehow you had access to a property that wasn't on the multiple, um, and something that they couldn't get access to, and that word starts getting around, you start becoming in much higher demand. And you start, uh, you then become known in the investment um, community as someone who brings that type of value. Because I guarantee you right now, it's he who has the deal wins. Um, and when you have the ability to bring that those deals in, that's really a key thing. Another side note on that too, uh, we have a lot of real estate brokers that I coach with that are using the strategy and that they're marketing to out-of-state homeowners. So they're specifically getting lists of people that have owned their home for more than 30 years, have no mortgage, and typically they're renters uh, that are in there. And uh, those properties may have not been updated. Uh, and they're simply saying, hey, we have buyers. It doesn't matter what uh, condition the property is in. Um, and they look at specifically the cost adjust or excuse me the year adjusted so depending on the multiple that you use and depending on the uh, access to data core logic is uh, a pretty good data provider uh, talk to your title company the taxing authority will have what they would call the equivalent year um, as far as updating goes and some of those are well it's taxed because the property has been updated and it's like it's 2002 well others are taxed because they've had no updating and maybe they're taxed like it's a year built 1974. You want to go out after the ones that have the lowest, um, uh, the lowest 
equivalent year built because those are the ones that have not been remodeled. There's been no notes in the tax records of being remodeled because those are the ones that need the work to bring them up to current market standards. Well, they're great opportunities then for potential investors to buy. Cool. Now, I just want to make a comment or two. So, so we're going to keep the overarching strategy, build a list that's exclusive. Um, I'm just going to show a really quick strategy or two for people who aren't too seasoned with conversion of how to do this. Um, one would be uh, if you're not going to do Jody's method, which is highly recommended because it is more of a private list. Um, but if you if you're going to go for the quick and easy, go to your conversion site, click on foreclosures, run a search in any area. That would be one way. Uh, another way to get a little more granular and do something that a lot of other agents in your market won't be doing, and this is one of my favorites, Jody, is to type the keyword motivated in. Um, so nice. if, yeah. you, if you search the remarks for motivated, you'll usually get a, a nice handful of properties, but even more important is that you'll get um, – Uh, is that people seem to reply off pay-per-click ads to the word motivated. It implies a deal. Yeah, that's yeah, that's awesome. Absolutely wow. awesome. You know, one of the things that we would use in our searches, too, would be things like estate. And you have to be careful with that particular word because it's like there's a lot of housing developments called such and such estates. But, you know, anything is estate or cash only as far as financing terms, mm -hmm. all of those then, um, you know, give it, it – yeah, it gives some pretty good results too. So, so you can uh, divorce create, anything that's distressed. So you can create that private list using your IDX. Um, but Jody, I definitely think that if even if you use this approach and you use your IDX site and and publicly available data, that you're going to need to supplement it by sending a hand-picked list or deal as part of your follow-up. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah. Uh, you know, my personal favorite strategy was just to go take a darn video. I took funny videos walking through for just beat up fixer uppers just yeah yeah absolutely yep so stuff like that um and then another another great just a side note on that too is you can actually kind of create just a quick youtube channel and just every time you're out uh, uh, of an investor grade home or looking at somebody driving by these code enforcement homes man take a take pictures or take video of the junk cars and the weeds everywhere and uh, I mean, I have pictures and videos of pools that are filled with crap. It's unbelievable, and people love them. They just, they, I mean, even if they're not investors, they love the channel or they love the uh, Facebook page because it's just funny, you know, to watch all the stuff, the anger management issues, things that are all destroyed and things like that. Yeah, so I'm going to illustrate real quick. Uh, Jody, I'm just trying to mix in what the topic here is lead gen and, and conversion. So um, nice. we've got the concept. We're going to go after investors. Uh, we're going to attract them to us, but we're going to take a, a little shortcut here and there. We can go to the courthouse if we want, uh, and I just want to show people really quickly how to target investors using Facebook ads, um, which which is, of course, my favorite source right now. If you go in and you do targeting, and you're going to help me, Jody, come up with a few extra ideas, I'm sure, uh, but if you go yeah. down to the interests, right here it says detailed targeting, I like to pick people who like specific um, uh, people like uh, Robert Kiyosaki. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, I'm going to get the newbies too, right? I, I hadn't thought of this before when, until you brought that point up today, but like Than Merrill, I guess, or Fortune Builders. Or yeah, something. Than Merrill or Edward Montalego. Right. Do you have any suggestions, maybe I'm not thinking of, uh, that would help us get to investors who are more seasoned? Yeah. Yeah, it definitely. I mean, so, you know, all investors are definitely not created equal. <laughs> right. And so, I, it really, I guess yeah, the very, very best way to find people, investors to work with is to go out and make, uh, have relationships with the hard money lenders. Okay. And the very best way to do that is to, in your particular area, uh, you reach out. You're welcome to become friends with me on LinkedIn. Um, you know, I, I've got a pretty robust business contact database in direct lending. Um, and if you look at the term direct lender, hard money lender, under in LinkedIn, 
you'll see and then just search on your zip code or your particular area you, and just identify the top hard money lenders in that particular area. And even more importantly, go, go down to the auction and ask where are people getting their, you know, where are they getting their, their money from? And here's what's interesting about it um, too, you know, Ryan. In fact, uh, actually, if you want to give me, I can drive if you want to. Uh, um, I, I show you exactly how to do this as well, if you want. Sure. Um, but yeah, in either way, it's totally fine. But if you uh, if you go and um, if you go and yeah, you just type in direct lenders. Here, I'll just uh, in your particular. I was having trouble finding the switch screen and stuff. <laughs> so yeah, direct yeah. Lender. Oh yeah, so direct lenders, right? Yeah. So just click on direct lenders, and then what you'll find is you'll find in your particular area uh, on the right hand side, you'll see there's the advanced tab. When you click on advanced, um, you will also then you can neck it down to just your area. So you want keywords direct lender, but you want location just in your particular area, right? Gotcha. And so maybe it's in Florida, your county, whatever, wherever that may be, right? So then um, the other thing too is I highly encourage you, anybody on this call, you know, reach out, become connected with Ryan, get connected with myself because that, that then expands your list of potential lenders. And then what you want to do is you want to reach out to those people. And you want to say, hey, listen, once in a while I run across an investment grade deal. Um, and if so, you know, do you have a list of people that, you know, I should send this deal to? And every one of those hard money lenders is desperately looking for deals for their clients because they want to get their hard money out as well. So, and they're not going to lend to anyone that's not qualified. So it's a great way to basically become a resource for hard money lenders. So how do you do that? Detailed targeting would be um, also look for, and Ryan, I don't know if you could do this. Yeah, is to see is there someone that can do direct lending or, yeah, hard money lender? Interesting. So it actually that's cool, pops dude. up. Dude, um, that's pretty cool. Yeah, I didn't know that. I mean, so. that that's, like a, that's totally ninja. That would be very interesting to test that because, man, dude, I mean, that's no one's doing that. I guarantee you no so, one's doing that. Right? So hard money lender. Yeah, you know, it's not a huge, well, that's only in Tampa. I can't believe there's so many. <laughs> that's Tampa, though. Dude, there's so much money. That's the whole thing, right? There's so much money, and there's a huge amount of competition to get money into people's hands right now. So huge these, amounts. These are people who are interested in hard money lender stuff, but I think you can actually do a private lender as an occupation. Oh, like, yeah. I'll play around with this hard money. Uh, so yeah, so you would offer the list, and you know these people are going to reply, and then you interact with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know you may even target, you know, saying that um, you know investor grade deals, or get you know get free access to investor grade deals. You put them in front of that. Yeah, I mean you're going to see those people liking that, forwarding that to their client base because they're all trying to add that value also as a private lender because they want to get their money placed. Gotcha. Yeah, you can search a lot of investor products too. So one thing I did, Jody, here, I didn't really say it. Uh, you can do the, the big gurus, the fortune, you know, Dan Merrill's and, and Robert Kiyosaki, and then just exclude based on income. So at least you're getting people who have over a million dollars in liquid assets coming in. Yeah. Um, and then, Ryan, you might want to try, too, just like the local real estate associations. So I don't know, like if you put in REIA, R-E-I-A, which is just the National you know, Real Estate Association, you may be able to... Um, uh, or maybe maybe it's actually Real Estate Investor Association. Maybe they don't go by the acronym. There you go. Yeah. So if you um, if you look at that, then maybe you can neck it down to um, just that local area. That would be another way. Um, HGTV people that are interested in uh, rehabbing, people mm -hmm. like Home Depot, typically you know as well, um, are targets uh, being able to play around with those kinds of things. Cool. So, yeah, and you can just go straight investing. But there's, you, the broader you go, the more qualifying you're going to end up doing. Um, yeah. Um, what is cool, though, you know, another point about real estate investing as a lead generation hook is that everybody knows real estate's the path, uh, like code name for a path to wealth. 
and everybody wants to get wealthy. So if you want to just get people into your database using investing as an angle, you may end up with a lot of people who might do a residential transaction with you. Mm. On the flip side. Very good point. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, I'll go back to the doc here. I try to keep these under an hour usually, but let's uh, let's come to a nice conclusion. I, we haven't had too many questions. Uh, Anna says, uh, you know, how do you handle investors to say yes to a list back, but they list with somebody else? Because you don't work with yeah. them. <laughs> That's exactly right. I mean, you basically say, hey, you know, for whatever reason, um, you know, you chose to work with the other person. Um, I can respect, you know, those reasoning, you know, that reasoning as well. Um, that's typically not the way that I would work. So I just wish you well in the future. Um, and if there's an opportunity for me to be able to uh, list a home for you in the future, I'd be happy to add some value. You def definitely don't want to burn a bridge, but I would never send them a property again, ever. Right. We had a question, you know, in counties I work, all the bidding is online. Um, yeah, that can happen, but but you can still, you don't have to necessarily go to the courthouse. You can just offer the list that's online. Um, mm -hmm. um, and, and other than the courthouse, Jody, there are plenty of investor meetings, as you, as you hinted at, too. There are places to go where investors congregate. Yeah, and, and another, and especially for online bidding, because I hear that actually quite often too, I just simply go down to your title company and get the distressed transaction report for the last 30 days and you'll get the names of all of those all of those cash buyers specifically for the foreclosed property, the properties that uh, transferred via trustee deed. So you just simply ask for that, and that that gives you your entire investment list right from your title company. Just say, hey, I, I'd like to see the last 90 days of, of every property that transferred via trustee deed, and can't really get any higher quality list than that. Great. So I'll close out just a few extra questions that came to mind as I was building the doc. The doc. Uh, one thing I think it's really healthy to do is to educate yourself on how to, as an investor yourself, right? Um, yeah. So I, I bet a lot of people are thinking, well, I don't really understand, <laughs> speak the language. How hard is it to really brush up and become an expert? Or yeah. No? Man, great. I mean, great, great question. Uh, <laughs> I mean, there's so much information out there. Um, what you want to do is you want to learn from people who have actually done it, right? And you can tell, you can tell the trainers that uh, are training based upon theory and the ones who have actually really been in the trenches to do it. So, you know, Ryan, I know you've got access to some really, really great high-quality um, educational materials yeah, as well that you, know, I don't plug you may or may not share at some point. Yeah, I don't uh, want to plug But you really want to look towards those quality providers um, but one of the very best ways uh, to do it, and if people want to send me um, mail again, you know, you just you can send me email at Jody at McNamer.com. It's just my name, J O D Y at M C N A M E R dot com. Um, one of the very best ways to do it is to just go through and do what I call an investor walkthrough, and you start looking for things that um, an investor would look for. Um, and you got to think about it in terms of when you are a real estate broker working with homeowners, they talk the language of things like, well, is this, are the school systems great, or is this going to be a safe place for my family, or is this going to accommodate my pets, or whatever that may be. But when you talk and think about a home in terms of the language of an investor, they're thinking about things in terms of what's going to be my return on capital, my return on investment. They look at three numbers. The number is how much will this property sell for once I have added the value, I've rehabbed it. Second number is how much will it cost me to get it there? How much will it cost me to rehab? And then finally, the number is, is then what can I purchase it for and still maintain a reasonable margin for doing business? So walk through properties and think about those three numbers. Forget about what it's listed for. Think about it in terms of what could you create and then what would it cost in order to get it there? And the more that you do that, the more that you'll be able to add that value. And be thinking about basic things, right? And, and you'll, as you talk with more investors, you'll know that, you know, carpet is going to cost you a buck fifty a foot. Uh, paint, uh, both trim and regular, is going to cost you a buck fifty a foot. You know, whatever that may be, whatever those numbers are, you know that windows are going to cost you five to seven hundred dollars an opening. You know, doors are going to cost you X amount. 
and start thinking about and creating your lists as you're going through these properties and that will allow you to, uh, um, uh, to start learning some of that. And then just like you said, you know, when you have investors, ask them, hey, when you walk through a house, typically what are you using? Uh, we have a calculator we use, it's called our Go No Go calculator. Um, and it literally is, we go through the house, we walk through it, we calculate everything it needs, and at the end it gives us whether it's a go property that we purchase it or a no-go property. It just doesn't make financial sense for us. And so creating those kinds of tools, but really it's about getting in the game and getting out and taking a look at houses. And when you're doing it, do a video walkthrough. And that serves as great fodder for your marketing materials and pictures and that kind of stuff as well. Yeah, so you could jump. I don't know if that answered your question. So yeah, you could just jump in and pretend you're an investor tomorrow and go find a deal and then take it to <laughs> the wider market. Wider market. Absolutely, dude. Absolutely. Yep. No question. No question about it. And then, have you ever done anything uh, to attract international cash buyers? Have you per personally, Jody? Or yeah, absolutely. I mean, ab Canadian. There's tons of Canadian money that's in, of course, Chinese capital. Tons of Chinese. In fact, we're seeing huge, again, I happen to be in the Seattle-Tacoma market. There is a huge influx of uh, Chinese capital coming in, buying luxury homes and renting them out. I mean, we're talking million, $2 million homes. They're being purchased as rentals right now. Wow, um, just in this some kind of return. Area. Yeah, and, there, and there's some specific programs uh, that if they invest a certain amount of money um, into this economy, uh, they're able to gain citizenship through that investment. And so we don't have enough time to go into those programs, but I would uh, encourage everyone on this webinar to familiarize themselves with the basically the purchased visa program so they can purchase their own citizenship by investing. And real estate is a fantastic vehicle. And they've just changed some of the regulations around on that. And so, uh, yeah. Highly recommend they uh, highly recommend they bone up on that. Uh, I'm getting a few extra questions. I, if do you mind people emailing you, I'll just put your no, not at all. They're welcome to shoot me mail. Happy happy to answer. Yeah. So so guys, I know this is a little bit off the topic of what we usually do here. We go hardcore tactics, you know, Facebook ads, uh, Google ads, and things like that. But I think uh, a lot of you know lead generation and conversion uh, has to do with identifying a niche market and then doing that traffic generation and conversion around the niche market and, and investors are as good as anything. I hope you guys got value uh, out of today and uh, Jody, just thank you. Thank you very much. Oh yeah, absolutely. It's absolute pleasure. And, uh, and you're absolutely right, Ryan. I mean, investors are a market that there's a tremendous amount of money that can be created here and a tremendous amount of repeat business. So as you start to put together your conversion websites, start driving investor related lists to that, um, you'll find that, that those opt-ins will, just like you said, uh, also translate into just regular buy and sell opportunities too. Uh, because we see actually even a lot of just newbie investors, one-off investors, that are purchasing homes, living in them for a year or two, and then buying another home. We see a lot of that as well. So they can be actually good long-term buyers for you too. Great, great. Well, thank you everybody for being here today. I'm going to get the recording live as soon as possible on the Facebook uh, fan page. Um, Anna says, thank you. You're welcome, Anna. Uh, and guys, yeah, just feel free to reach out to Jody at McNamer.com if you have any questions. And uh, we'll get this live with the doc and everything else uh, in the next 24 hours. Thanks, Jody. Yep. Take care. See you, Ryan. Bye, y'all.